I don't think it's right because what we need really is a kind of balance between the sciences on the one hand and the arts and humanities and social sciences on the other in universities. Um, it would be a very poor university that didn't encourage anybody to think about what is the nature of the good life or how should we treat other people or what are the grounds for making a judgment or how can we think critically about the problems that we face in sort of day-to-day -day life or indeed in the world at large. And if we think recently about some of the big challenges that we've had in the United Kingdom, for example, questions about terrorism, these are not questions which are solved by science. I mean, forensic analysis can pursue the perpetrators of those crimes uh, as much as it can. Um, it can be involved in covert forms of surveillance. Um, it can find other ways of tracking them across the globe. But actually, the real problem that we have to address is terrorism in the heart of society at home. In other words, how do we deal with the fact that some people want to kill other people because of the values that they hold and that they will not agree to share common principles, common values, common spaces. And those are questions that can't possibly be answered by science alone. And in fact, we can't really turn to science to deal with all sorts of problems that, that we're worried about and concerned about. Think, for example, of the arguments about euthanasia. Should we be allowed to die peacefully or die at a time of our own choice when we know that we're not going to recover. Now, medical science will always and perhaps very rightly seek to prolong life wherever it can and also to reduce pain, to reduce suffering, to find new ways of addressing disease um, and misery. But the question of who decides, do we want our doctors to decide those things? Will they, de will they decide on the basis of the technology that they have in front of them? Does the fact that we can, for example, replace someone's heart mean that we can now say every time we can prolong life we're going to do so at whatever cost? Or should we be able to have another group of people whose job it is to think about how will we decide about those things? What are the values that we hold to? How will we develop them in the future? So all kinds of questions come up all the time that need not just reflection but critique and they need sustained thought and research. These are not questions that you can answer just by looking into your heart and saying, what is the answer to this question? Now, often people feel that they can. People of faith, for example, feel that they have an absolute answer to those questions. But actually, the point about a university is it provides a space for two things. The first is for a group of people whose job it is to think full time about those kinds of problems, to look at what happened in the past, to try to imagine what will happen in the future, to put together different bodies of evidence, to assess those, that, those bodies of evidence and to make judgments. And the second thing is it's a space for teaching. It's a, a space for teaching other people to have those skills and capacities. Um, and I think that's an enormously important thing. And I don't think, therefore, that in a modern society, or indeed in any society, that we can say, we were, we we're going to teach science at the expense of the arts and humanities and social sciences. I just don't think that's possible. One of the most important things that a university does is to provide a space for teaching. And the reason why it's important to teach the humanities, and that includes the arts and the social sciences within that broad definition of humanities, is because we need a space where we can teach people how to make judgments on those matters, how to think clearly, how to assess evidence, how to be able to engage with other people um, over points of disagreement. In other words, to, to be able to manage conflict, to be able to manage argument, because these are not matters on which we're going to get necessary agreement in society. That is, we will not get everybody agreeing that they believe and think and feel the same thing, but that doesn't mean that we can't have a degree of workable consensus, and that's a matter uh, for education. One of the things that we have to understand about science is that, you know, the invention of the wheel was enormously important. Um, the invention of space travel may still turn out to be very, very important. I mean, it's taught us many things about uh, other universes, other galaxies, uh, many things perhaps about the origins of life. I'm not quite sure what putting a man on the moon has done for us per se, except it was an enormous achievement. But uh, I think that what comes out of the humanities, which is particularly important, is how we are going to think about where we are now and where we would like to go. And science will do that through developing new forms of technology. 
But the question is, what do we do with these new forms of technology? So, for example, um, let's think about the ability to produce um, what is colloquially called test tube babies, or the ability to clone cells, even to clone sheep, potentially now to clone humans, the ability to do work on stem cells. Now, all of these discussions are enormously contested in society. The fact that we can do these things doesn't answer the question, should we do them? And this is what the humanities does. It addresses those kinds of questions. Now, obviously, the humanities will not put a man on the moon. But the sciences and around the humanities, which we can call broadly the um, social sciences and cultural studies and so on, will definitely ask a question, which is, should we be attempting to put a man on the moon? Should we be spending money on putting a man on the moon? Or would we be better spending that money on trying to eradicate malaria, which kills large numbers of children all around the world. Um, you know, science has done some things for us that the humanities could never do. In other words, for example, it has eradicated smallpox. In the 16th century, and right up to the time when Edward Jenner invented that vaccine, smallpox was one of the greatest scourges for all of humankind, killed enormous numbers of people and disfigured even more. Humanities, in a sense, cannot point to one kind of achievement of that sort. But its achievements are ones which have endured far longer. In other words, they have endured since the beginning of, of human societies. And these are achievements about how we live together, how we learn, how we share, how we decide what is just, what is right, what is true, what is beautiful, what is an appropriate way of being human. So these are the achievements of the humanities. But if we turn for a second to what can you do with a humanities degree, well, actually, the truth of the matter is that a very large number of our business leaders are trained in humanities. If you turn around the world, you will discover, that, of course, some of them are economists, but equally, some of them are people who studied history or studied literature. There have even been one or two business leaders who said that studying the ancient world was the best thing that they ever did because it allowed them to develop a strategy for management. I'm not sure that nearly that all aspects of humanities teaching can be so uh, instrumentalized. But what it does teach you to do is to think about what motivates other people, to be aware of argument, to be, know how to be persuasive, to be uh, someone who thinks in a way which is logical and powerful. It asks you questions about ethics and about integrity and how you should operate in the world. And that would be important if you were a journalist. It would be important if you were the head of a big corporation. It would be very important right now if you were a banker. And perhaps if we had more people trained in the humanities, we might have less crisis in our financial sector. Well, I think if we didn't study the humanities, we would quite literally lose our way in the world. We wouldn't know how to think about the societies we live in, how to hope that we will have a better future in those societies. Think, for example, what's happening in North Africa at the moment. That's not a, a story that you can understand simply by turning to science alone. For this, you need some understanding of anthropology, of sociology, of history, of political science, uh, indeed, even of reading and writing, because you need to understand what opportunities have been afforded by the internet. So the internet, of course, depends on certain kinds of technological developments. But the way in which humans have communicated using the internet, the particular way in which blogging has developed, the particular way in which um, images captured on mobile phones or captured on small cameras are immediately available on YouTube and a number of other sites, this is providing other people around the world with a an insight into that form of political protest, but also it's allowing them to hear the voice of hundreds of thousands of people in North Africa who want a change in the nature of their government, in the nature of their society. And we're no longer now having to just rely on the main major newspapers and the major news channels for that information, but we can actually hear people themselves creating their own news, talking. So who would have thought when the internet first started that one of the things that the internet would do would be to turn large numbers of ordinary people into writers, into citizen journalists, into people who are actually political analysts, who are prepared to be activists, who are prepared to put up information 
uh, on the internet, but also to make films. So large numbers of young people are now filmmakers. There's a, a huge uh, development of, of skills and critical thought and a huge change in the way that critical thought can be applied to government. So already we have a change that's quite fundamental, almost in the nature of the political and in the way people think about what politics is and how they might address issues of the day. So I think that one of the things we have in the, in the humanities and in the arts and the social sciences taken together is a way of understanding over a very long period of time how we as humans, as human societies, have thought about the challenges that we confront. And many of those challenges are thrown up by science. It's not as though that the, you know, many of the old questions are not answered. In other words, the question of what is a good life? What is a good person? These are questions that we will never have a final answer to because society changes around us, the environment changes around us. But we also need to think about, for example, look at the debate that's gone on, on over climate change and the great discussion of, you know, is the science on this right or is it wrong? What do we believe? How should we judge? What will we do about that? Now, in order to make a space for ordinary people to not only understand what that debate is about, but to engage with it, there needs to be some kind of way of encouraging people to assess evidence, to understand that not everything that they are told is true. That's one of the most important things an education teaches you, is to be critical, to think, to be sceptical, to ask another question, not to be satisfied. And we could turn to any question and say, how much do you think people, ordinary people, have learnt about climate change from the science and how much do you think that they might have learnt from reading Cormac McCarthy's novel The Road or from watching the film that was made of it. And I think you would find that it isn't just that you can learn different things from reading the novel or looking at the film, but it's also something where once you see the human drama, once you see the decisions that have to be made in that film about the mother who walks out into the night and decides that she will take her life rather than wait for it to end as the world ends, that's a moral decision. And in trying to judge whether she's made the right decision in leaving her little boy behind, those are the kinds of things that the film dramatizes for you. Science can't dramatize that for you. It can't force you to think through that ethical issue. What it can do is to provide you with data. Say, if you do this, then things will be better. But as we know with climate change, one of the difficulties is we all know that there are problems about carbon emission, about air travel, about the way we treat the planet. We know, for example, that the state of New York uses more energy than the 40 most poor countries of the world. We know that these things are a scandal, but how are we going to get agreement on them? That's something that we deal with in the arts, humanities and social sciences. How are we going to reflect on these things? How are we going to know what the human cost is? And I think that's, that's one of the reasons why it's terribly, terribly important to study the humanities, because otherwise there's a very real chance that we will lose our way. One of the things we have to be clear about is we study the humanities and the sciences at university in order that we produce teachers who then teach people in secondary schools and indeed in primary schools. That it's not that the university is disconnected from other ways of learning and thinking in society. And we need, we have a desperate shortage of teachers. We actually need more people to agree to enter these professions. We don't want to be in a situation where fewer people are studying these things. We actually need more people to study them. We need more people who can draw on those skills and capacities. But also when you come to work in business, when you make a judgment about what you're going to do, how you're going to run a project, for example, who's going to be involved, what kind of evidence that you, are you going to hear, how will you make your judgment, you're going to take that to your board and so on. These are all skills which you acquire through an education in the humanities. You do not acquire them through an education in the sciences. Now, it's, this is not to say that I believe that the arts and humanities and social sciences and the sciences are sort of two enormous opposing forces. I don't believe that. I think it's a very good thing and probably a very proper thing you know, that many of our doctors are also uh, fine poets and great musicians. This is terribly important that we should do all of these things. It's equally important that somebody like me, who's a social science, scientist, should be um, mathematically literate, 
should be able to a certain extent to deal with scientific information, which I do. And I think that there are lots and lots of situations in life where you need crossover. And I mean, you see this, for example, in um, a subject like economics. Now, economics is partly, of course, about um, game theory. It's partly about uh, complicated mathematical models and so on. But equally, economics is increasingly about how do we measure satisfaction? How do we know what well-being is? In present day economics, more people are talking more and more about we shouldn't just be measuring GDP. We should be thinking about things like emotional prosperity and well-being. We should be counting the cost of the way we live, not just in terms of um, products produced and supply and demand in the market, but also in terms of things like how how are we to account for people's diminishing satisfaction in the workplace? What are we going to do about rising suicide levels in certain um, sections of the population in certain countries? And these are questions which clearly we need an ability to think about, but not just to think about them, but to act on them. I mean, most contemporary government policy is evidence-based, and it needs to be evidence-based. But more than that, it needs somebody who's able to think about and critique those forms of evidence and to link them to issues about judgment, ethics, as I've said before, the good life, and I think that's very important. Well, I think the humanities are the, the disciplines, um, the ways of researching and thinking that allow us to reflect on the character of being human and of what being human means in its interaction with the wider world. And that includes other humans, but it also includes the natural world. Um, indeed, it includes those things beyond the natural world. So it includes, for example, uh, other galaxies, but most particularly, perhaps, things that we can't see, but which we firmly believe in, amongst them uh, God and the nature of the beautiful.